Primary Care Week, and um, thank you everyone for your support. We have uh, the banquet tonight, so if you signed up for that, we're really excited to have you. And tomorrow afternoon, um, remember that there's the primary care diagnostics um, in 107A uh, from 11 to 1, and we'd love to have you come check that out as well. And then also uh, building a house with Habitat for Humanity on Saturday. If you haven't signed up for that, we'd love to have your help with it. Um, so our panel today is going to be focused on primary care innovation. And we have a wonderful group of physicians here breaking ground in primary care. Um, I have three questions, so I'm going to kind of get them rolling with, and then we'll be able to open up to the group. Um, so the first thing is just to introduce yourself um, and offer anything that you'd like in terms of specialty, um, background, uh, residency, and maybe training after residency if you did a fellowship or anything like that. Okay, and so not necessarily kind of where we're moving right now yet. Just not yet. Career. Okay. Just a general introduction. What do you think? Should we start on this side? Yeah. Okay, my name's Peter Lehman, and I'm a 52-year-old family physician on the other side of the state in Polesbo, Washington, which is kind of near Seattle, but over on the side that's not too crowded. I went to George Washington Medical School in Washington, D.C., and graduated in 1990. And I chose uh, to have the military pay for my uh, medical school because it was and is the most expensive medical school in the United States. And I didn't want to come out in a lot of debt. So I did a three-year residency just outside of Washington, D.C. and uh, got board certified in 1993 and have done it every seven years since then. And uh, sort of the quickest after that is I spent three years paying back the military for my time. I was in Fort Campbell, Kentucky and moved to Polesbo, Washington 20 years ago to join the group I'm in now, and you'll hear more later. Hi, I'm Pamela Weibel. I'm a family physician. I've been practicing family medicine for 20 years, and I've had a wild ride through many jobs that were not ideal that I will share with you. And I am now in my ideal medical clinic for the past 10 years. It is the best experience ever. You all deserve the same thing. I love going to work every day. I really don't plan to retire because I just love what I'm doing so much and I, I actually don't even like going on vacation because I miss seeing my patients. So um, maybe I'll just give you a little fill in on what I did my first 10 years after residency. Um, you shouldn't make the same mistakes as I did and just continue taking jobs that are not really your dream job. You can go straight into your dream job if you like. But my first 10 years, I basically started at a multi-specialty group in Oregon. I, so I had six jobs in 10 years, because um, I never found one that I really liked. So multi-specialty group with like hundreds of doctors. Then I actually did like a summer stint with Yakima Valley migrant farm workers in Woodburn, Oregon. And then I opened my own clinic in a carport in my house for all uninsured, which was really fun. But I didn't see how it was replicable and going to solve the whole problem with healthcare in the country. And I'm a real systems thinker, so I was really looking for something that could be replicated. And after that, I jumped back into what I call assembly line medicine. And I worked in Washington State in a, um, in a hospital owned clinic in Lake Forest Park outside of Seattle. And then I went to Olympia, Washington and worked in a single specialty group with three family practice physicians who wanted me to become a partner uh, if I signed on the dotted line. And basically, um, in order to ever leave that job as a partner, I'd need to give an 18 month notice and find a suitable replacement. And that felt like a prison sentence to me. So I really couldn't sign anything like that. So I moved back to Oregon and worked in a, another family practice office part-time only Wednesday and Thursday. And that's when I got to this point of feeling like, wow, if I can't even be happy in family medicine only working two days a week, that's pretty lame. Something is seriously wrong. And so from there, I had the epiphany that led to the whole idea that I could really have an ideal medical clinic designed by the community and I could work for them. And so that's 
pretty much what I did. Um, I led a series of town hall meetings, invited my community to design their own clinic, and I pretty much told them I would do whatever they want as long as it's basically legal, and I've been doing that for 10 years, and it's a blast. So highly recommend um, not just saying patient-centered, but actually like doing it. Like put the patient in charge, have them help you, because then you won't um, be so tired, because they'll be doing all the work, and then they'll feel honored and respected because they really are the center and there won't be that invisible tug of war that I, that I felt all the time in exam rooms at other offices where you were trying to put them on an algorithm or a paradigm they didn't want to be on and they were there for a whole other reason. So anyway, so that's my little story. <laughs> my name is Yami Lancaster and I am here because of her. So her glitter's been like rubbing off on me for the past few months. Um, and I'm a pediatrician. I've lived in Yakima for six years and practiced pediatrics at Yakima Pediatric Associates until September 18th. Um, I went to medical school at Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine, so I'm also a DO, yay. And I also have a Master of Public Health and a Master of Science, which I did all in five years during medical school because I'm crazy like that, plus my first son. Um, I also did a uh, Osteopathic Manipulative Medicine Fellowship during that time. But because I decided to go into peds instead of geriatrics like I was initially planning, I don't use it quite a ton, so sorry. I don't want to feel too ashamed about that. Um, and what I've done since, medical, since uh, medical school, I went to residency at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center in Cincinnati, which was excellent training. And then I, this was my first job here. The reason I took the job here was because I'm a National Service Corps scholar, or was. I finished my repayment in August. I did two years full-time, and then I did four years part-time for the National Service Corps. So as soon as my commitment was done, I was ready to break away from the traditional US medical system and do my own thing, and have been learning from Dr. Weibel about how to do that. And so I'm super excited to tell you guys about what I'm doing. Um, but additional, additional to that is that my biggest passion is nutrition and lifestyle. So some of you may have been to my class that I gave last year, um, but I am certified in plant-based nutrition. I'm also a certified food for life cooking instructor through, through the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And so I talk a lot about eating more plants and you know, sleeping adequately and meditating and all that kind of stuff. And that's why I want to be able to have the time to integrate that into my practice because I think that that's going to save a lot of lives. So that's me. Wonderful. Thank you all. We're super excited to have you here. Dr. Weibel kind of uh, started this for us, but I'm curious, you're breaking ground and pursuing different forms of primary care delivery, presumably because the delivery model that you're working in previously um, didn't fulfill your needs as a physician or the needs of your patients. So I'm wanting you to sort of describe what that environment was like in terms of size, um, patient panel, support staff, so we have an idea of, of sort of what, you were, what you're leaving and why. The before and after. <laughs> I can go first, just okay. because. Um, so I, I wasn't, um, it wasn't like I was super miserable or anything like that. So I worked at Yakima Pete's for six years. Uh, there uh, I was one of five physicians and uh, we had nurse practitioners, nurse practitioner PAs, like three to four at a time usually. Um, I started full time for two years, but honestly, I'm a super, efficient person I can see a lot of a lot of people so it wouldn't be unusual to see 30 patients in a day plus you have to do your charting and return phone calls and sign a lot of paperwork there's a lot of paperwork in medicine these days um, so it, it it's not like it's just like torture it's more just like day after day after day it, it can be a little bit soul-sucking um, and then I went part-time after my second son and I felt like, okay, I was okay for a while. But what happened was that I had had this dream of serving the community and really helping patients in the way that I felt like they needed to be helped. And for me, that's really talking about lifestyle because you guys know what our major problems are in the United States, right? So these five minute appointments, which really you only get like five to seven minutes per patient if you have a 15 minute appointment because half of the time you're just like staring at the computer typing and like rushing and like getting from the next one and so it really wasn't enough time I felt to really do patients justice as far as what I felt they needed 
to live a healthy life and to prevent chronic diseases, 80 to 90 percent of which are preventable through lifestyle choices. Um, so after a while, I just became really dissatisfied, discontent with with what I was doing. I didn't feel like I was doing my best work. I felt like it wasn't excellent. And I, I want to be as excellent as I can. And so in order for me to be excellent, I felt like I had to leave the traditional US medical system and try it a different way. And I am married to a physician as well. So I'm married to a hospitalist who makes a much bigger income than I ever did anyway. And because of that, I felt like I could have the luxury and the freedom to be a rebel and try something a little bit different. But I love Yakima Pediatrics. I loved who I worked with. So some of you guys may know the physicians there. They're awesome, amazing. My staff, everybody was great. It's just that we were all part of this system that there was no way we can break away because we were part of Community Health Center. So when, it, when you're part of a big system like that, um, you, can't, you can't practice differently. You have to see a certain number of patients. You have to practice a certain way. Um, and so I didn't feel like I had that freedom and that liberty to do things my own way. OK, well, I'll try to keep it short because <laughs> you've got so many good stories to tell, I'm sure. Some of the things I could really piggyback on in terms of when I left the military, um, I debated whether I wanted to be in academics because I really liked teaching a lot. And, um, but I really valued kind of the idea of being independent and being able to just be a doc. Uh, because in residency, you know, you spend a lot of time teaching uh, younger students and whatnot. So I ended up joining a group that at the time, 20 years ago, was about 35 doctors, multi-specialty group, and it's about 75 now. And I will say, wonderful group of doctors. Uh, never had any complaints or unhappiness about being part of the group. Um, ten years ago, I got diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. I didn't even know adults could get it. And um, kind of a long story how that happened, but the bottom line is by the time I realized what was going on about halfway through my career, personally it really changed my life. I really lost the ability to do pretty much everything besides walking. Um, so the last ten years, being in fee-for-service, which fee-for-service means um, all the services that you provide get paid by a third party. So it could be insurance company, uh, Medicare, Medicaid. It costs a lot of money. You have to hire quite a few people and spend quite a bit of money to cover that. And your only option to sort of stay ahead is volume. You've got to increase the volume of patients that you see. And I have never liked that idea. In fact, I've spent most of my career seeing fewer patients than all of my partners. Um, and just made less income as a result. So how does the muscular dystrophy fit in? Well, initially it just affected my personal life. And it took me a year or two to kind of get okay with that. Um, the last year or two has become really difficult to see a lot of patients. If you need to see, I'll even stay in the low end, if you need to see 20 patients a day to have a decent living, turns out that only about 1% of patients in general on any given day have a reason to come into the office. So if you need to see 20 patients a day, you need to have about 2,000 patients that are yours to fill your schedule. And I probably got about 2,500 patients. And I, for the most part, love all of them but trying to provide care for 2,500 people and seeing 20 patients a day and doing all the things that you end up doing when you're not seeing patients really has made it impossible for me to continue to do that. And for the last year and a half, I sort of have struggled with saying, what am I gonna do? Um, I wanna work till I'm 80. I love being a doctor, I just hate the job. Um, <laughs> and I had just the dumb luck to hear a five minute talk by somebody who's, I think, kind of a pioneer like Pam, Dr. Josh Umber in Wichita, Kansas, who right out of residency um, began a clinic called Atlas MD. And he sort of set a model up where patients paid a membership fee directly. And patients basically got, lawyers don't like us to say this, but unlimited care, um, which is really true. You need to be seen, you get seen. You need to talk to your doctor at night, you talk to your doctor at night. You need to talk to your doctor on the weekend, you talk to your doctor. 
and the focus is all on being your patient's doctor and your salary being because they're paying you, you take all of your costs away and that's your salary. Everything else you provide is to be a benefit to the patient. And between spending time with Josh and one other doctor in the country who was kind of doing the same thing, I said, aha, this is my salvation because I can't work on a treadmill anymore. I want to give the kind of care that is slow. Slow medicine is what I'd call it. Um, and I always tell my patients, what's the one thing that you wish I had more of? Time. And I want time. That's what I loved about actually being in medical school. You get time with patients because mm -hmm. nobody expects you to go fast. So um, about a year ago is when I kind of found this out and I said, this is for me. If I do this, I can practice as long as I want. I want to be old Doc Lehman and somebody say, he's been my doctor for 40 years and he comes to my house, which I will. And he's been there in all the significant events of my life. And my kids have seen him and they don't get scared when they come to the office because they know him really well. Um, so I've spent the better part of the last year planning to leave a very secure job at which I make a very decent living to do something that I have no idea how it's gonna work out, which is to say $10 a month for kids, $50 a month for adults, I'm your doctor. I work for you only. I work month by month. You're not happy with me, you don't trust me, you don't uh, view me as your partner, you have no obligation to me. Um, I will be opening January 1st. Um, of my 2,500 patients, I've got about 150 patients so far that have said that they want to join me. And along the same lines, as I say to my patients, you know what, we don't have to play by anybody else's rules. We can't, you know, we can't be illegal. Uh, but we can make this clinic whatever we want, and I want you to make it with me. And I've always told patients, um, I get as much out of the office visit as you do. And I want to have the time to be able to do that. Um, I don't know exactly how this is going to work out, but I know it's the right thing. It feels right. I know I'm going to give the patients the care that they deserve. And I get to be a doctor again, full time. So I'm uh, excited and uh, frightened at the same time. Uh, but honestly, uh, I don't see any other way to go. It, it is what being a caretaker and a partner is. You just have to have time for people. So that's the story. And the good thing is, is that even though I have muscular dystrophy, I honestly do think I can do this as long as I want. Great, thank you. And that actually leads really nicely into the next question. So maybe um, Dr. Weibel and Dr. Lancaster, you can kind of fill us in on uh, the details, like Dr. Lehman did, um, of the practice that you're pursuing now um, and what that looks like in terms of patient panel, reimbursement, time, support staff <clears throat> as well. Okay, well first I want to give you a cheat sheet. You've got to write this down because this will totally help you understand what your job options are in the future. There are only two types of medical practices. You're either in a production-driven practice or a relationship-driven practice. And you will know the difference on your rotations, whether you're in one or the other. In a production-driven practice, you'll, people will be very frantic about time. People will be really worried about no-shows. People will be counting you know, between 20, 30 plus patients a day. And that is all about numbers. It's a numbers game. It's, um, I also call it assembly line medicine. The other option is relationship-driven practice, which is, I think, what everyone wanted when they filled out their personal statement to attend medical school, is you wanted to have those deep, especially in primary care, those deep, satisfying relationships with people over time and their, over generations of their family. So it's your choice. You actually do get to choose one or the other, and you should have the right language to be able to understand what you're in. So those are the two options you have. Underneath that, you could subdivide those into three other options, which is um, whether they are 
patient-centered practices, physician-centered practices, or administration-centered practices. Again, um, you will, is, is the practice set up for the convenience of administrators and for people making big salaries, middlemen, and, and other sorts of people in a big box clinic? Or is it like set up for the convenience of the physicians? Or is it really, truly, authentically a patient-centered practice where if you asked patients there, do you feel like you are the most important person here? Do you feel like you're the center? And they would say yes. So those are another set of options. And then as far as payment structure, there's only two types of payment. You're either getting paid directly from the patient or getting paid indirectly from a third party. So the most, um, I, 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 and, and under indirect, I want to add that un, under indirect, you could be getting, these are third parties like insurance companies. Um, you can subdivide that into local or non-local. So, you know, like in Eugene, we have Pacific Source Healthcare plan located actually in Springfield right next to my town. They're a local insurance company. If I have trouble with them, I can go right down across the street, you know, across the river and sit on the desk of the woman in the front and try to figure out what's going on. And they have really good customer service. And so that's an example of a local insurance company. And the way I have set up my practice currently well, let's just say what I was in before was primarily assembly line medicine. So all those practices except my carport clinic were uh, production driven practices. And they were all administration centric or if it was a single specialty physician owned group, they were physician centric practices. They were not centered on the patient and they were primarily indirect payment, okay? Now, what I'm currently in, this model created by my community, it's relationship-driven, it's patient-centered to the truest degree that I've ever seen. Um, and also, it is a mix of indirect and direct payments. Primarily, the indirect payments come locally. So it's a community-supported medicine-structured clinic, kind of like community-supported agriculture. And I will say that the further you get away from a relationship-driven, patient-centric, direct pay practice or throwing in their local indirect payments, the further away you are getting from your patient. If you wanna have a very deep, spiritual, emotional, physical relationship with somebody over the continuum of time with multiple generations of their family at that deep level, you will most you will, you will be able to do that more likely with a relationship-driven, patient-centered practice in which the patient has some skin in the game financially or through barter or trade. I don't turn anyone away for lack of money. People have barter and traded services with me. But it's really, really important that the patient, healthcare is not passive. If you allow a patient to receive passive care, like I don't believe in charity care, they need to do something. If they can't pay you with money, they need to pay you with time or devote an equal amount of time to the community that you've just devoted to them. You've spent an hour helping them with their pneumonia, then they need to spend an hour at the soup kitchen serving people. They need to do something. This is not about gimme, 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 take, 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 don't contribute anything. So I'm sorry to take so much time on this, but I really want you to understand the basic clinics that you have an opportunity to join when you finish medical school. And so, yummy. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree with what Pam's saying. I, I, one of the things I want to say before I go any further, because I think it's very important, is that there, you know people go into medicine for different reasons. But I think that probably most people that go into medicine, you go into it because you truly want to help people and you have that calling or whatever you want to call it in your heart that you want to serve and you want to put your hands on people and you want to help them um, in their suffering. Um, there are going to be a small percentage of us that go into it strictly for the money. You can make a heck of a lot of money as a doctor, okay? You can sub-specialize sub, sub and see a bunch of patients and do a lot of surgeries and you can make a lot of money if you want to. However, if you're the kind of person that you went into medicine because you want to help people and you want to serve and you want to do the best thing for people, it's going to really clash against your ideals. And you're going to feel bad and you're probably going to get depressed. 
So one of the things I will warn you about is we kind of have this as med students and doctors, we have so many years of delayed gratification. And right now you guys probably feel like super poor and you see other people and you're just like, oh, I can't wait to get my fancy car, my big old house and stuff like that. Um, I will just say that choose wisely what kind of lifestyle you want to go into because we just downsized our house. I don't plan to buy a new car till it dies because I don't want to sacrifice my ideals anymore. I want to be able to have the freedom and the liberty to serve my community the way I want to and not feel chained to make a certain income to pay my lifestyle. Does that make sense? So think about that now because once you graduate from residency, you're going to be like rushing to like buy all this stuff and fill your house full of stuff. and. You're, it's gonna make you stay possibly in a system that you're not happy with because you have to pay back all that stuff. So that's something I wanted to say before. <laughs> I know that's kind of like more philosophical, but it's important. Just keep it there in your mind because it's gonna be a few years to get there. Um, so uh, I left Yakima Pete September the 18th and since this summer I have been working on starting my ideal medical practice as a pediatrician and I just signed my lease on Friday. So I have a location, yay! And um, so the way I wanna do it is kind of more similar to Pam, almost like a combo, but I thought about doing the membership um, model and decided not to, at least not exclusively do it that way. I'm going to start as an out of network physician, fee for service. So I am going to charge for the service I'm providing um, on a cash basis. Now, um, the really cool thing is that there are lots of changes happening in the United States because it's not just us that are dissatisfied, but it's also the patients that are dissatisfied. And um, there's some new kind of cool insurances that are presenting themselves. One is a co-op insurance. And so I actually already have patients that have joined me and they have this co-op insurance because they function as cash patients and then they get reimbursed through the system. It's, I don't understand it fully, but um, I already know that there's a lot of these patients in Yakima that would potentially be interested in coming to see me. Um, and what's really cool is that Pam has given me the confidence to do this, and she said, don't worry. Do your job the way you want to do it, and people will come to you, and it's completely true. I mean, people are emailing me, oh my gosh, do you still have space? Have you stopped taking patients yet? Because I really want to come see you. And it's like they're so desperate to just have a doctor that actually has time to listen to them. It's amazing. Um, and so even though it seems like it's a really rebellious sort of thing to do, it's what patients want, and it's what we used to do a long time ago. It's old-fashioned medicine that's coming back but it's more, you know, it, it seems rebellious because the standard medical system is not like that anymore. Now, I am going to practice part-time, and the reason is because I still have other stuff I'm doing. I teach cooking classes quite a bit. I have an online presence that I'm trying to grow. Um, so I have a lot of other things I'm working on that I feel will also contribute back to the world and humanity and hopefully get us all healthier. Um, and so I'm gonna be practicing part-time, and of course, I'm also a mom. I forget to mention that part two, that's kind of important. Um, so um, three days a week, scheduled appointments. However, like Dr. Lehman, I plan to be available for after hours and weekends. And I will also be doing house calls, which I've already started doing, which is so fun. It's so great? fun. Oh like my gosh, fun. I just can't I explain to you how fun they are. <laughs> it was, I was just sitting there like on the living room floor with the baby on a blanket. And you know, the kids, like the other kids were just like all relaxed. It's like completely different. Uh, I love it, so I can't wait to do more of that. And I plan to do all my newborn visits up until two months at home so that they don't have to bring the baby in and expose them to germs and stuff. So I'm really super excited about that. Um, and what's really fun is I get to dream and help patients design the clinic with me. I put out a survey on SurveyMonkey, which is the moms my age are into that kind of technology. So I've been getting feedback about what they want. And, and what do you think the number one thing that they want? Time. They want to have time with their doctor. That's not high tech. It's not like any. They don't want fancy stuff. It's the same thing you were saying. It's completely <laughs> true. They just want you. They just want a caring doctor who wants to sit there and talk to them and listen to them and help them and reassure them. 
because pediatrics is probably like 75 to 85 percent reassurance for real it's, it's kind of not that hard of a job guys but I'm just gonna pretend like it's hard but it's not that hard it's not so, rocket um, science it's not rocket science so uh, I'm super excited and hopefully I will get enough patience to be able to keep me plenty busy um, but I also be open to having you guys shadow me anytime so if you guys are interested in seeing how it works I hope to open my doors in March but I'm already doing house calls so we'll just kind of see how it evolves thank you I know you want to do a question can I just do one minute because I was trying to piggyback on that I am such an idealist um, I am, I don't know, naive enough to believe that the more of us that do this and say the system does not benefit patients the way it should, it burns out physicians, the more of us that do this, I actually truly believe we can save medical care in America to where, I mean, people do need insurance. You know, you, you have to have it, but your primary relationship with the doctor who is going to be spending most of their life with you does not have to be expensive. And, you know, I don't know how many people here are considering going into primary care, but, you know, across the country, it's dying on the vine because although it's attractive in terms of the relationship, students kind of know, gosh, the job isn't all that great. So to be able to see this, we get more people coming into primary care. They're going into a type of primary care that patients love. We reverse the, here's all the specialists and here's the primary care doctors. And the solution to America's sort of health crisis comes from within, between patients and doctors, not waiting for some other people who don't quite honestly care about us or patients. So I really hope that all of us are doing something that will actually be big, so. And two financial pearls, because I know you have student loans to pay. I saw the tuition for the school. I, I know what you guys are <laughs> having to pay to live in this beautiful small town. And so I just want to say that I realized that when I first started my part-time ideal clinic that I could make just as much money working part-time on my, you know in my ideal clinic as I could make full time working for like the man and so it, I really want to share like all my financial stuff with you if you email me off of idealmedicalcare.org I'll send you like a 10 page document with all my financial information that shows how I, I'll just give you a quick example of like I literally the same appointment like a whatever 99213 let's just call it a you know $100 appointment for I don't know sinusitis or something in the old job that I had I had um, an overhead that was 74 percent so that meant that out of that visit I earned $26 pre-tax but I was able to get my overhead down to close to 10 percent at my um, no staff I do everything and I love it uh, job and so that meant that same person I kept $90 so it's a real difference when you see a, a patient for sinusitis and keep 26 versus $90 you literally can make make three times as much per patient if you keep the money instead of working for a big system that let's just face it it eats a lot of money and the one other financial pearl I want to talk about is that we currently live in a country that handles an ingrown toenail the same way it handles a lung transplant the same financing mechanism the same infrastructure the same overhead and it makes no sense because I can do an ingrown toenail or she can do a well child check on the floor in your house for very little money you don't need a helipad you don't need a five-story hospital you don't need a five to one staffing ratio you don't need like the infrastructure the 74 percent overhead plus that you would need to do a lung transplant to do an ingrown toenail or a pap smear and so I think we just need to understand that like car insurance insurance is for catastrophes it's not for rock chips in your windows it's not for filling up at the gas station it's not for changing tires on your car you know insurance is for a lung transplant insurance is for big cost items and we should let people at the community level have their relationship driven patient-centered practices and those payments can be worked out locally in a way that serves everyone, and that's how everything was done before 1965 anyway, so. And can I just say, okay, so I, I can't be super confident like Dr. Weibel is yet because I really haven't actually started, but from my projections, 
seeing 30 patients a week, I should be able to make the same as when I was seeing 30 patients a day. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll echo <laughs> so, that. But since I haven't started yet, I can't tell you yet for sure if it's going to work here in Yakima. I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm very cautiously optimistic that it might work. Um, but that's what I projected out. And my overhead, as I have it calculated right now, will be about 17%. My space is a little bit more expensive, but I also do some side jobs too. You know, I teach cooking classes and do those kinds of things. So the actual medical overhead will probably be closer to about 15%. But that's what, and I'm also gonna be solo, solo, just like Pam. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be the nurse, the doctor, the MA, the receptionist, I'm gonna be like the everything. Which is super fun. I'm excited. I'm, I'm doing one staff. I understand. It's okay. It's actually... <laughs> okay. my, my overhead's about 20%. That's 21, awesome. Yeah. But for me, uh, my medical assistant, who's been with me forever, I mean, literally, we are doing this together. Um, she's hourly in this system I work in. She's salaried with me because there's no way I'm paying somebody hourly who is as intimately involved in making this as anybody else. I debated doing it by myself, but uh, part of this, the 52 and the muscular dystrophy and getting tired and all that, I said, Gina is her name. It's like, Gina, you need to just stay with me. You need to make sure I get everything done. But the overhead, I mean, my overhead is going from probably 60 to 20. Yeah. So you can do a lot with that. I mean, you can keep your income the same. You can say, I don't need that income. I'm going to take that loss of overhead and do all kinds of different things that I would have felt like I can't do that stuff before because it's going to cost this and I'm already spending that much money so it's really freeing mm -hmm. it's and all your imagination limits you by the way there's no right or wrong way to practice medicine I mean if you love the fast pace of urgent care and you want to see like 80 patients a day and you love it and the patients are getting great care then go for it you know my whole issue is that doctors should not be practicing medicine as victims so if you feel like a victim you cannot be a victim and a healer at the same time so you need to live your dream the one that brought you to medical school you absolutely do to prevent depression uh, we have a high suicide rate in this profession if you are going to stay here and practice medicine and call yourself a doctor, please be congruent with the original dream that brought you to medical school in the first place. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I just, uh, so from a patient perspective, if they have like an acute trauma something, how does that fit into like your guys' care plan if they're paying monthly? Like do they, would they just still have their, obviously you have to have insurance, but like just how would that transfer? You said a trauma, like if they have a like yeah. something they need to like go to the ER or something for. Yeah. So just to repeat the question, if a patient has trauma or has like needs tertiary care services, how does that fit in with what we're doing? I mean, with me, it's the same as if I was working at another clinic. I mean, if it's out of my scope of practice, they go to the place where people can handle what their condition is, and it's paid for by their insurance, probably. Um, yeah. It'll be it the same for me too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I tell my patients, okay, I'm a smart guy. I know a lot of different things. I've delivered babies. I've done all these sorts of things, but there are things I can't do. And so what I'm offering is not that. I'm not offering everything. And patients say, well, what if I need to see a specialist or what if I need to go to the hospital? I say, well, how do you do that now? They say, well, I go to the hospital because it's really serious. I say, well, that's how you're going to do it down the road. For me, since I chose to do um, like a monthly set fee, it's a set fee whether they come in every day if they're a hypochondriac and I say I'm going to make an appointment at 1 o'clock every day until you get tired of coming in. Um, I couldn't do that in the, in the world I'm in now. Um, I, I look and I say, okay, I'm, I work for you. You're, you're paying me to work for you. So I'm going to do everything I can to take care of you within what I'm allowed to do and what's within my comfort level. So I tell my patients, if you call me at night and it really can't wait till the morning, but it's not an emergency room visit, you cut yourself with a kitchen knife. I will say, can you meet me down in the office in 30 minutes? I'll see you down there, we'll take care of it tonight. It doesn't cost anything if someone sees me 100 times or one time because they're paying me to be their doctor. So that's the way I've 
set it up is that I work for you only and I do everything I can do for you when you need it because nobody determines really when they need care and so to do this you have to be the kind of person who is willing to say okay I'm not going to just be in a group where I only have to take call you know one week out of the month it, which is very alluring um, but a lot of patients wonder, well, I'm paying you and I have insurance, how does that work? It's like, well, you use your insurance the way insurance is supposed to be used. For the things that cost a lot of money and that are so urgent, you got to get there. I can't take care of heart attacks in the office. And, and by the way, even though I'm on call 24-7 for like 11 years now, my patients rarely call me because they get 30 to 60 minute visits. They get their needs met when they're supposed to get their needs met, which is during an actual office visit. And so there's rarely any random, by the way, I forgot phone calls. I also do refills only during appointments. So I prevent like the 30% of stray irritating faxes and phone calls that most clinics get because they're not thinking ahead. And so I just want to say that being on call 24-7 feels like I'm on vacation because nobody calls me because I have, like, they're all on autopilot. Like, I've trained them well. I do my job well. They know when to come in. And so it's not going to be, because people can't believe that. They're like, oh, my gosh, I'd be, I'll never, they'll not, you'll never get away from them. And it's like, well, it's amazing when you, I yeah. think it's like a two-way street because they respect you the way you're respecting them. I mean, of course, I haven't opened, but I t this is what I tell my patients, and they say, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother you at night, Dr. Lehman. And it's like, no, if you need to, please. I mean, I'm your doctor. Mm -hmm. I'm here for you. But everybody I know who does this says, I don't get many calls at night because patients know they can get in and see me that day if they really need to. We have a really close relationship. We value each other's time. And if they really call me for something, it's because it's serious. The current system it's very depersonalized, you know, the production-based system is very depersonalized and it leads to desperation in a lot of patients because they, when they call, they don't know who they're going to get, they're not sure if they're even going to get to talk to somebody, actual, an actual person, they don't know how long it's going to be before they get called back, and it makes people kind of panic and then you overreact, overreact, everybody's overreacting all the time, we're overreacting, everybody, everybody, everybody's like crazy all day long. So, I mean, the way that when you do it when your relationship, relationship base system just like this they know who they're calling and they kind of think about it should I call for that or not what's really important to call about what can wait till the morning it's not the same as this desperation based depersonalized kind of system So the question is about economic disparity and how do we uh, fit that into our practices and who um, initiates the whole bartering idea and, and what do you do? Like I personally don't turn anyone away for lack of money and I live in a town that has you know rich people and poor people and I see like a mixture of people. I kind of like the blue collar middle of the road crowd and also I love the people that are off the grid live in the woods on hardly nothing in cabins. And so I get a lot of kind of third world style medicine at least when I first started and I will say that the bulk of these people who see me they all pay their iPhone bills and their other bills every month and things that they value you know they pay their $100 a month bills and so it's not like you're charging them something that's astronomical 10 or like $50 or a month like that's like cheaper than cable that's cheaper than their iPhone and so we somehow think that oh these people they just don't want to pay well they don't want to pay for disrespect they don't want to pay for a system that abuses them and us and they don't want to pay to sit in an appointment and argue with you about you putting them on a paradigm and an algorithm they don't want to be on. So if they're not paying you 
look at yourself in the mirror and try to figure out why they're not paying you because I will tell you in 11 years it is like less than 1% of people that really couldn't pay me and what I have in my practice is they get a 30% discount if they pay at the time of service so people like don't want to give that up and so they pay at the time of service to get that really good discount and for the rare occasion when somebody is really financially strapped I've allowed them to like make me different handmade gifts that I put in my gift bag basket that then get recirculated out to other patients as prizes and um, I let them donate like what their love is for the world and what their work is in the world if they're an artist they can donate artwork and then I you know kind of reuse all of this and um, give it back to other patients because I don't necessarily need everything that everyone can make so um, so what do you guys do well if ten dollars a month I right. could afford that Right, so $10 a month for kids up to age 20, and then $50 for any kid over the age of 20. Right, so, <laughs> um, so um, you know, my kind of philosophy is sort of like that, that, I mean, I don't think $50 a month is kind of an outrageous amount of money to basically say, I'm here for you 24 hours a day. Um, I do think there are people who are destitute. Um, I haven't had to sort of, well, certainly in my sort of current multi-specialty group, I don't have, I haven't had to deal with that. Um, I agree with Pam, I don't think I would just give somebody care for nothing. Um, just because if somebody gets something for free, uh, there's a certain sense about how they value it, that, that giving something is important. Um, because I even thought, well, what if I'm doing really, really well a year from now, I could offer people a free membership. And the more I thought about it, it's like, no, I don't want to do that. I want to have some other means that that there's again the kind of idea of skin in the game, and that you know this is a two-way street. Um, and I also believe, to me, the idea that somebody who has a lot of money gets the same care as somebody who doesn't have a lot of money is very appealing to me. Uh, uh, one of my uh, kind of mentors who practices back east, he's got a picture of uh, the CEO of one of the big insurance companies in the state where he works, sitting in his exam room next to a guy who literally lives in a box and scrapes together the, month, the money each month to be seen. They each get the same care. The guy who's living in the box sees the guy in the fancy suit and knows, I get the same treatment that he gets. So I'm pretty big on, like, this is what it is and you know the value I'm bringing to you and you can decide if that price is worth it. Because that's the way life works. Mm -hmm. Just gonna say real quick, I know first years have anatomy lab, so if you need to go, please do so. Um, just please sign in and, and grab one of Dr. Weibel's books on your way out. Um, and also, all three of these doctors are gonna be at the banquet tonight. So if you come um, from 6 to 6.30, it's gonna be all mingling time. Um, so you can ask more questions then. And I will stay here as long as yeah. it takes to answer I, everyone's question when this I'm is not over. I'm going anywhere. <laughs> so similar to the access question you just asked, I've been wondering, what about language barrier? Okay. How, how do we improve on that, thinking that it raises some difficulties with the direct service model requiring that common culture, common language? in a way that, yes, production, having worked for the Farm Workers Clinic and Family Medicine, realizing that that is not necessarily a solution to that as well, but I'm realizing just now for the first time that the, the direct service model still, kind of, especially being in academic medicine, puts the onus on the university to improve the access for the physicians in training to match the culture and language needs of the community, other than individual desire to make sure that you have those skills. So the question is the language barriers um, for people who I guess are not English speaking. How will they, who, who's taking on the burden of this population and how do, the, do our models um, contend with this? Well, I speak Spanish, so I guess I'm Panamanian. Um, but, you know, going, I didn't really answer the other question. I, I am still evolving the way that, you know, I'm going to practice and so I'm not opening officially till March. Um, and bartering is legal, if you ask that. But they kind of do want you to pay taxes on it, though. So <laughs> when, I, when I asked about that to my, they're like, well, you have to put a value to it somehow and declare it. And I'm like, OK, whatever. Um, so uh, 
I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just speak Spanish, English, a little bit of French, and, and like maybe five signs in sign language. So besides the English and the Spanish, I don't know how, how I'll be able to reach the other people. But I know that there's language lines and things like that you could probably use and stuff so like I'm that. So I'm going to give you two answers. Uh, I speak Spanish, uh, and it uh, gets better and better because um, I have a lot of patients currently who I think will follow me who speak zero English. Uh, they may have been in the country 20 years. They, they live kind of in a familial, they cousins and whatnot. They're sort of uh, insulated. So I speak Spanish, which helps. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to hear this, but this is, uh, I think this costs about $4. It's called Say Hi, like S-A-Y-H-I. Um, I know it's available for iPhones, and I guess it's available for Androids. And you can go between English and any language and backwards. So I, I don't know any Japanese, but I'm going to say, I'm very pleased to meet you today. All right. So it's all in Japanese characters, which I don't understand. Yeah, one more time. Okay. And put so, it near here. I've got a microphone. Okay, so <laughs> let's just see. Oh, I gotta figure out how. Okay, well let's do Russian. Does somebody know a foreign language here? Okay, we'll do Russian. Thank you for coming to the office today. Right, so it, it shows me. Yeah, close, yeah. Close enough. It, it shows me that it recognized, thank you for coming to the office today. So I see it in English, and then it says in Cyrillic characters, I don't know what. Here's this little button over here in Cyrillic characters in Russian. So they can click over here on Russian. They say something, and it comes out in English. It's a little slower than, but. There's 30 or 40 languages in this. This is four or five dollars. And with a 30 to 60 minute office visit yes. instead of a five minute office visit, it's, you're like likely to be able and to I do pick a up good some job. Bits of a language. Right. And I will tell you, I mean, this. So my clinic, um, 30 minutes is our minimum appointment. And I tell patients we do not have a maximum. Uh, we, we take what we need. If someone says, my parents are getting older. We've got to talk. The family needs to get together and talk about going maybe into assisted living. I say, okay, do you think 90 minutes is enough time? Can we get it done in that time frame? Should we book a little bit longer? Because there's no, you're not volume driven anymore. You're quality driven. And if I have 500 patients and I said about 1% of people really need to come to the office, that means on average, I might see five patients a day physically in the office. I'll talk with others, but time no longer becomes the thing that drives what you have to do. So something like this is actually fun. Yeah, and that's awesome. And I majored in Spanish in college, so I could handle Spanish-speaking patients as well. And that's exactly the population who I wanted to deal with primarily. It just didn't quite work out that way. Uh-huh. So what do patients do who are waiting if you end up in a 90-minute visit with somebody? I think you're scheduling the appointments yourself, Correct. so nobody's Correct. waiting. I'm yeah. scheduling the appointments myself. If I run more than 10 minutes late, I have a gift basket, and people get to pick a gift, like a locally made, handmade soap, lotion, whatever, um, if I'm 10 minutes late. But again, I know my patients like the back of my hand, so I know when the traumatic brain injury patient is scheduling appointment with me that I want to put her at the end of the day because it takes her longer to kind of get her sentences out. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, and if you live in the world that I'm leaving and that you've been in, you're not scheduling the patient. You give maybe advice to the scheduler about these sorts of problems need kind of about this amount of time. But in the old days, the nurse and or doctor by themselves, you know your patients, you know what they need. You're not gonna get really surprised. And you know we have patients right now who call in and they say, I'm um, coming in for a rash. Well, that's not really what they're coming in for but they wanted to say something to the appointment clerk that wouldn't be revealing of something really personal. 
Well, if I answer the phone and I say, you know, what are you coming in for? They'll be likely to tell me, or I'll say, is, that, is there anything else you're going to think you're going to want to cover? Because we want to make sure we have enough time. And so, you know, we block the time out. What I would do, if even that was beginning to push it, I think that's a great idea, is that I would say, gosh, you know, we booked an hour, and I was really surprised that this is going to take longer than that. Can we maybe follow this up at an appointment tomorrow or the next day? Because I know I've got another patient waiting, and I you know, really want to respect everybody's time. And I think you know, when you're giving people a lot of time, and it sort of is running over, unless you just have to, I think you know, it's all respect, and people get it. Yeah, that's when you've got a 15-minute appointment and you say, well, you can only really have one. I'm sorry, you have to pick yeah. whatever's the most important thing. I know you got a list of four things, but you've got to pick the most important because we don't have time for four. What's interesting about your question is it's a real kind of reaction to a failed production-driven model. Um, so this isn't really an issue, I don't think, for us. Uh, I rarely in 11 years have run more than 10 minutes late. And so... Yeah, and I'm still, we're still using technology. She has her own homemade electronic medical system. I'm using a free electronic health system, and I'm going to do scheduling. I'm going to allow some online appointments to be made. So I'm, it's not, I, I don't see, feel the appointment time is going to be vague, I feel like, for me. I like having times in my head. So, um, and like they do, my, my minimums are probably going to be around 30 minutes and uh, 45 minutes for well child checks. Yeah. So. And we do, we will, we will block them out. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, it's not like, oh, we're like, we'll block 90 minutes out. Gone if is I'm the going day on, of double bookings. I if mean, I'm going yeah. on a house call, <laughs> I mean, I, I will book in the schedule that I'm going on a house call. It's just an appointment that's at the home. So somebody else doesn't get booked and they're, wait, well, where is he? So you just book it that I'm going to somebody's house. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what's the skill level required or that you would be developing if you're seeing 30 patients a day versus 30 patients a week? Okay, so this is a great question. And this is recently something we discussed in our little group that we had for her class is, um, whenever you're seeing 30 patients a day, there's stuff that you probably could handle yourself that you don't because you don't have time. So you're like pretty much a referral machine. Or a so, prescription machine. Yeah, you're seeing a lot of stuff, but you're not doing it yourself. And you're but still I'm so flying. excited that now I'm going to have time to actually be like, okay, let me look up the best treatment. I can actually call the subspecialist, be like, hey, what would you do for this? Okay, let me handle it myself, see if, if I have problems, and I'll send them to you eventually. But when you're seeing that many patients today, you do not have time. You're just like, okay, I don't know how to do this off the top of my head, so dermatology. <laughs> okay, I don't know how to do it, so rheumatology, you know. Um, so yeah, that's a really good question, and that is one way to think about it, that if you see a ton of patients, you're going to see a lot, exactly, but you're probably not going to be able to handle it all yourself. You just don't have time. And one thing that I started doing, which I highly recommend, and it's so much fun, is that if you do end up having to send one of your patients to a specialist after you spent multiple 30 right. or 60 minute appointments with them, you have the luxury to now go to that appointment with them. That. It's so much fun because then yes. you're like, basically the way I practice, I feel like I'm a smart doctor and a perpetual medical student at the same time. It's like I can always approach everyone with like the bright eyed excitement of the first day of third year and spend as much time as I want. It's so much fun. Yeah, I tell my patients, I said, what if I came to you, came with you to your specialist visit? And they're, they're like, what? For $10 a month, I get all that? Yeah, That's and um, I just oh, yeah. would just block it out. It's like, yes, because then I know that the specialist, look, I get to learn, and they don't miss something that I know that maybe the patient forgets to say. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I want to give our panelists a big round of applause. Thank you so much. If you haven't signed in yet, please do so here on the right. Grab one of Dr. Weibel's books, and all three of our panelists today are going to be um, at the banquet tonight for more questions. Um, I apologize, our PA yeah, students. I hear them. Have this room. <laughs> okay. Um,
Thank you. I wasn't on the calendar. So <laughs> That's okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This is perfect. I so very much appreciate it. This is You're exactly welcome. what I was hoping. That was so much fun. Thank yes. You. All right, so tonight is we have to be here at 6. Uh, yeah. And this it's a different building. It's that new building, yeah. Yeah, I think the. Uh, or maybe it's that way. I'm. I get. I'm not good with spatial. Just like done this for the PA students too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right.